This is Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. Seamus, when you meet with families of individuals with known ties to terrorism, have you encountered any surprises? No, I guess the, the first surprise and the most overwhelming one is a sense of regret uh, and a sense uh, that, that they, they did something wrong, right? Like the father would say, you know, if only I didn't, I stopped my, my daughter or like, you know, this is my fault. I didn't raise her well. And even if you kind of convince someone that, you know, if you're 25 and they've made their own decision to join ISIS, it still doesn't stick with them. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion podcast, we're joined by Seamus Hughes. He's the deputy director of the Program on Extremism at George Washington University. He's an expert on homegrown violent extremism and countering violent extremism. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we're going to talk with Seamus about common assumptions and perceptions surrounding terrorism, extremism, and radicalization. Before Seamus Hughes took on his current role at George Washington University, he worked at the National Counterterrorism Center, where he served as a lead staffer on U.S. government efforts to implement a strategy to counter violent extremism. He often led engagements with Muslim American communities across the country. He provided counsel to civic leaders after high-profile incidents, and he met with families of individuals who had joined terrorist organizations. Seamus created a groundbreaking intervention program to help steer individuals away from terrorism, and he worked closely with the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force, Fusion Centers, and U.S. Attorney's Offices. Before that, he served as the Senior Counterterrorism Advisor for the U.S. Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. Seamus, how did you find yourself gravitating to what best can be described as intensive work in counterterrorism? Oh, I didn't mean to be. So I started my career in campaigns, and I absolutely hated it after four months. So I then went uh, on Capitol Hill. And the only reason I got into to counterterrorism was because the guy that was doing counterterrorism on the Hill um, took a new job and homegrown terrorism at the time, that was like 15 years ago, you know, there's only like three or four cases a year. Uh, and the average age of a terrorist recruit was like 22. So the staff director looked at me and said, you know, you're 22. This isn't a big issue. Why don't you take it? And so I just ran with it from there. And then I kind of grew as, as unfortunately the problem grew, did about a dozen hearings on Capitol Hill. And then went to the intelligence community for a few years, and then have been a GW for the last four. When you started working in this area, did you have any certain preconceptions about terrorism that may have surprised you as you went forward and learned more about it? Yeah, I thought it was bigger. You know, my my frame of reference was was 9-11, obviously, right? And and that's orders of magnitude. But in the U.S. context, you know, you're only talking about something north of 180 folks who've been arrested for ISIS-related activities. Uh, in the last five years. And so it's a relatively small phenomenon, dangerous and deadly nonetheless, don't get me wrong, but a relatively small. Now, since then, has your mindset evolved, uh, not, not just in terms of the facts, like the numbers, but uh, what's your mindset about terrorism now that might be different from what it was before? I mean, the most surprising data point that gets me is looking at it is, you know, the vast majority of these folks are U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents. You know, most of them grew, were born and raised here, and that shifted my thinking on, on how I looked at the threat. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because you mentioned the Americans, and I, that's exactly where I wanted to go next. I wanted to talk about a person that you wrote about. You wrote about at length for The Atlantic, and it was a very detailed piece about a person by the name of Zulfi Hoja. From what I understand is ISIS doesn't really have a big presence in America, but it's often been characterized as lone wolves. These are attackers who claim allegiance to the Islamic State. They showed little formal connections to the operatives overseas or even other like-minded Americans here. They were described as lone wolves. One of the stories you wrote is about Zulfi Hoja. Can you tell us a little bit about him and his story? Yeah, Zulfi's an interesting character. So um, 
son of an of an immigrant born and raised in New Jersey, lived above his family's uh, pizzeria outside of Atlantic City. He gets involved online, mostly in gaming um, platforms, and he reaches out and, and talks to a guy named David Wright from Boston. And him and David become fast friends. And they start at some point being involved and interested in ISIS. And then from there, David and, and Zilfi reach out to another guy in, in Syria, a guy named Junaid Hussein, who's kind of a pretty prominent kind of rock star status of an ISIS guy in Syria. And um, Junaid helps um, Zilfi get over there. Meanwhile, David stays in Boston and, and plots to uh, behead a, a local anti-Islam activist. So, you know, what's fascinating to me was Zufi is the first time that we saw an American in a beheading video, his beheading video. It took a long time to get that information. Uh, and it's, it kind of speaks to kind of the work we do here at the program, which is a bit of investigative um, work. So we saw that there was um, some exhibits in a court trial in Boston uh, that mentioned his name. And then we, we cross-referenced that with other court records. And then we started cold calling um, law enforcement sources and, and asking around. And then we got so far as, as you know doing voice recognition for videos of ISIS propaganda to see if it, it connected. And we put all, the, all that all, all together and kind of built out a mosaic and was able to identify Zulfi as kind of a senior commander in the Islamic State. Well, that's an interesting story. And you did a great job summarizing it. I, I think after I read your article, I thought this would be a good individual to study and and illustrate some of our other points. So according to your article and your research, you found out that he made his connections on the internet and he was able to connect with ISIS facilitators and they helped him travel to Syria. Your story of, of Hoja starts in May 2017 when the Islamic State Media Office produced and released a 45-minute video called, We Will Surely Guide Them to Our Ways. And in that video, that you described in the article and you just mentioned was that beheading. Can you describe the circumstances for that beheading and the purpose of that video? Yeah, the purpose of the video, so Zulfi is, is standing um, in front of a kneeled Kurdish prisoner, uh, and he gives a message to, at that time, President Obama, um, telling him to stop committing the attacks and, and bombings in Syria, Syria and Iraq. The message is like a minute, minute and a half, and then um, the beheading is a few more minutes um, in very graphic detail. Uh, and I think there's twofold. One is, is ISIS is trying to use what they always used, which was overtly violent imagery to try to encourage folks. And then the other thing was, you know, you had an American doing it. And so he didn't identify himself as an American, but he spoke in perfect English, um, and he, he made his message directly to the U.S., Obviously, they thought that would resonate with other Americans that they were trying to recruit. So these these videos were, they weren't just to intimidate Americans. They were recruitment videos, weren't they? They were. They absolutely were. So we know what those, also the interesting thing about ISIS is, you know, a good number, probably the vast majority of its propaganda wasn't violent in nature. Um, and it sounds counterintuitive because it's a foreign terrorist organization, but a lot of their messaging was so-called positive messaging, like electricity in Raqqa or giving candy out to kids in, in Mosul. They were trying to project this sense of we are a, a functioning government, a functioning state, and you guys should come join um, the caravan. Well, this video, obviously, Hoja's already over there, and there's another person that was on trial you mentioned, and his name was David Wright. And he would eventually be sentenced in America to 28 years for what was, he was in federal prison for providing material support to ISIS. But before that, there was this uh, case made against him. And in the course of that case, we started to learn a little bit about this other American, this American who was in that video, this American who had that perfect English, who we could see in the video beheading uh, one of the prisoners. What did that do to attract the federal government's attention when they saw this American in these videos? Did that pique their interest? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, this is the first time you saw an American committing a beheading for ISIS videos, so it clearly did rise to their level. Uh, and Zulfi, uh, and uh, conversations that I've had with a number of different sources, Zulfi was quickly rising through the ranks, and so they were a little concerned about um, the prominence that, that ISIS was putting uh, on his messaging. And I think there was a concern that anyone who knew Zulfi was, would, would also be a, a dangerous threat to the U.S. And Hoja would have been around 25 years old at that time when that video was produced in 2017. And what we know, uh, based on the research that you did, is he departed to the United States for Istanbul, Turkey, 
in 2015, he arrived in the Islamic State held territory in Syria not long after that. We find out then in that case that there were some other techniques that they used, I guess, to recruit people. And, and it, it comes through when we talk about this relationship between Wright and Hoja. How did they meet and, and how did they get to know each other? Yeah, they got to know each other primarily online through through gaming sites. They both big big fans of I think it was Call of Duty at the time, uh, and they would exchange messages uh, on Facebook, and then they moved to encrypted apps. I, it's not clear to me whether they had any physical world connections. Jerry's still out on that, and so they were able to build this relationship, which then um, the relationship helped get Zulfi overseas. What did they have in common from a worldview point of view? I mean, obviously they met because they liked these violent video games, like you mentioned, Call of Duty and, and Mortal Kombat, I think, was another one. They obviously had something in common that, that helped them connect with each other at a more emotional level. And what was it that drew one person to the other? Yeah, I mean, I think at some point they had a shared belief in ISIS. And so the general belief in jihadist belief is the need to build a, a so-called caliphate, a, a Islamic utopia that would then be run by um, their interpretation of the Quran, and that, that clearly was a that ideology was clearly a glue for the two of them. Do you know that ISIS actually used video games as part of their recruiting process? Yeah, it, sometimes they do, in, in a way that they make their videos look like a video game. Um, meaning that it, that there's been some reporting of of hostages that have gotten out. Um, where they would literally tape the same attempted beheading multiple times over multiple uh, days and just not do the final act because they wanted the camera just right. right? They wanted to get the angles just right, the, the lighting just right, the, the look of fear just right. So they did take a, a lot of effort to make the propaganda um, look as good as it would in, in Hollywood or or any kind of, or Fortnite. Like, they want to they wanted try to make it realistic. There was another aspect to this that we know about. These cases still are rare. People that actually make it from America over to Syria and become ISIS fighters. Not that there aren't others that try. 50 people were arrested trying to make that journey, and other people were arrested just supporting people who wanted to fight for ISIS and plan attacks. So there is a very vigilant counterterrorism function in America Based on what you know, do you think they get most, more than half, or less than half of the people that might be engaged in these activities? I think the FBI has a pretty good handle on the, on the threat. So in context, you've got 1,000 active investigations in all 50 states, uh, and then you've got 180 folks that have been arrested or charged with ISIS-related activities. The FBI, and if you look through the, the numbers, the FBI at least had some sort of touch point with every single individual who traveled overseas before they traveled. So maybe they didn't have enough to arrest, arrest them, but they were on their radar. I get a sense that that it was a little bit harder in 2011, 12, 13 time frame. I think the, the intelligence community was still playing catch up to get an understanding that, you know, uh, 50,000 people from 100 different countries were traveling to Syria and Iraq, and it was just overwhelming the system. But in the later years, 2015 on, I think they get a sense of, of, of what's happening. Um, and they've got a pretty good fin- finger on the pulse of the threat. And they're playing a little catch up on the other side, which is you know, domestic terrorism or extreme far right, trying to catch up on that and in many ways mirrors what they were trying to play catch up on for jihadism. Well, that, that's an interesting point. I do want to talk about that. But when we talk about, well, when we talk about radicalization and the use of video games and the use of the internet, I would think that the FBI's really have a, has a big arm that's, that's investigating things at that level. But what do you know about the combination of offline versus online methods to, to recruit people? Yeah, it absolutely is a combination. So there's a reason why the numbers in the U.S. are relatively small compared to, um, say, most European countries. It's because there isn't as large of an offline dynamic. So you're more likely to join a terrorist organization if your best friend joins a terrorist organization. And because there isn't uh, extremist organizations in, in public kind of pronouncements in the U.S., with some notable exceptions, it's harder to recruit. Right? There's not guys handing out leaflets at Times Square about how great the caliphate was. Whereas there was guys in, in Birmingham in the UK handing out leaflets talking about that. And there's a reason why the UK had 850 travelers or people that tried to join and did join in the Islamic State versus the US, which you know had something less than 200. And so the offline dynamic matters. But in many ways, it mirrors up at some point, right? Your, your offline persona is a reflection and in many ways, the, uh, the personification of your online persona. 
And so when a guy gets arrested for terrorism, you know, the Associated Press will look at his Facebook profile and say, and he's got a black flag, you'll say, oh, that's online radicalization. Well, you know, of course they're online because the average age of an ISIS recruit is 28. So if you're not online, you're an ISIS Luddite, and that just doesn't happen. And so you just have to peel back the onion and realize that in many ways there's a connection between the two. You mentioned the European uh, volume, I guess, of, of people that are more open about their recruiting. How do they get away with that over there where they can disseminate information, printed pieces, and, and do it more publicly? Yeah, the, the U.S. has been fortunate because we have something uh, on the books called the Material Support to Terrorism Clause. It's a very broad statute, and we can debate the ethics of it, but um, it's a broad statute that allows the FBI to interject themselves into the conversation at a much earlier time than our European partners could. And, and, and it has some tools that if you, let's say you drove to the airport, and you had a ticket to go to Turkey, and you communicated with a guy that was in ISIS, that is enough to put handcuffs on you under material support. Whereas in Europe, the UK being the best example, it wasn't illegal to do any of those things until quite recently. And so law enforcement's hands were, were very much tied, and it allows for networks to build out because nobody's getting arrested for their actions. And then one of the things that you had mentioned was this offline and online behavior and how one supports the other. And I think one of the things that you wrote about was how to prevent radicalization. And it wasn't as specific. You didn't have a checklist on what families can do or what people can do to prevent someone from joining ISIS or some other terrorist group. But you did have some tips. So what would you say friends and families should watch for if they suspect there's something odd with one of their friends who, who could be radicalized. Yeah, I mean, that, that's absolutely right. There isn't a checklist. But there is, when you look at the cases, there's, there's something called a bystander effect, whereas after someone leaves to go join the Islamic State, you know, everyone says, oh, yeah, of course, that makes sense to me. It's like you know when a train wreck's happening, but you can't put it all together in your head. There's some overt kind of actions that people would take, trying to apply for a passport when they haven't traveled before and, and talking about things they haven't talked about before, uh, communication on, on encrypted apps, although, to be fair, journalists use those all the time, and pulling back from friends and family. Now, all of that, though, wrapped together could be just teenage angst. So you can't, you can't overthink this a little bit, but it, it does make sense we put it all together. Usually when there's a big terrorist incident, whether it's overseas or somewhere in America, the media will go up to family or friends and they'll ask them, what did you see? Did you see anything beforehand that was a sign? But I, but that makes me also think of how the media has covered terrorism. And it doesn't seem that you hear as much about terrorism in the media these days. Can you figure out why that might be? Yeah. I mean, one is the, the number of people have, has clearly diminished. You know, 2015, we had 65 arrests for terrorism for ISIS-related acti activities. This year, I think we're on track for like 15, maybe 20. So the numbers have gone down. There's that. But the larger issue, too, is just, you know, it, there's been a press suck, like uh, getting away from looking at terrorism and looking more at, at what's happening in D.C., You've got the usual, the Department of Justice reporters are, are being pulled off the terrorism beat and looking at the indictments and the Mueller report and things like that. And so focus is going elsewhere. Do you think these are misplaced priorities from the media standpoint, or would you say these are appropriate? It's understandable, but probably the pendulum sw swung too much. And I think at some point the pendulum was too far towards covering terrorism, but I think now it's too far towards covering the nitty gritty of the latest filing and you know, the special counsel's office. These things are all important, but you don't need, a, you know, 20 people reading through tweets to do so. Uh, what, I can, what I'm concerned about is not necessarily the, the coverage of a guy who gets arrested, but really you're not having the ability to do the long-form type of investigations you would need to, na to do to figure this out. Like you don't have, you can't assign a reporter six months to, to figure out what made, you know, David Wright or Zufi Hiljic tick. Uh, you just don't have those resources put in place anymore. And you have seen a number of mostly major newspapers and, and major news organizations pulling their terrorism um, reporters and, and moving them on to national security in general. I get it from a, from a resource perspective, but you're going to miss stuff. I work in the public relations business, and I notice it myself. Just when you look at the way the media covers everything these days, it's it's almost like a, a pack mentality where everybody moves to one story, they cover it for about a few days, 
when that news cycle expires then they move to the next big story so they don't quite have the resources or they don't allocate resources to those uh those more intensive investigations yeah and uh, i mean there's also just you're seeing people move from different media organizations quicker than you did in the past so the institutional knowledge is is starting to to fade a little bit you know i i spent my career started my career in the senate and i worked under a guy named jim mcgee who's a pulitzer prize winning reporter from the washington post and miami herald and you know he taught me everything i knew about how to do investigations and i don't know if you see that kind of same old hand that you would need to kind of guide um, younger and, and hungrier reporters and because of the way the media cycle is now you know w- what was breaking news this morning is not going to be even on the front page by the end of the day it just it's fascinating to me to watch it really is and you mentioned something a few minutes ago about tweets uh, about reporters reading tweets and i that's sort of a pet peeve of mine because when i see when I'm, when i've talked to editors that one of their biggest complaints is they have to encourage younger reporters to actually call people or go visit with people they because so much of of what you can find is online and a lot of reporters young reporters will do that they'll 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 base stories and information on what they find online yeah that's absolutely right and it's actually the same problem in, in the research community too because, especially when you talk about terrorism it's it's not that hard to find a court record on the online repository but a court record's only going to tell you part of the story and so we do a lot we fly around the country and do a lot of in-person interviews. You can get a sense of a person when you look them across across the table, uh, or like making cold calls to people and seeing if they'll talk. You get the best information if you pick up the phone. Um, then you got to be willing to do it. And I I think there's a, an air of a sense of um, no, I've got this because I've got a document that tells me. But um, but the document doesn't tell you the whole story. No, it can't. It, it, there are so many nuances in that in that interview and, and all those nonverbal cues that you can pick up on. I guess when we look at the priorities then of the media, does that affect the quality of the media coverage we're getting? Or do you would you say the quality is there, it's just not allocated towards where it used to be? I think the quality is there, and there's really kind of an interesting time, too, because you have these smaller um, news organizations that are popping up, and I think there's this, this interesting time of what actually means to be a journalist, right? Is it is it the Mercury Press badge that gets you into the Senate gallery, or is it, you know, your investigative chops? And you see a lot of these journalists cutting their teeth on, on smaller outlets like Verge or Gizmodo and then moving up to larger outlets. And I think this is an opportunity for a whole lot of coverage um, that's going to be at least surface level. My concern is going to be when we get deep. It's the deep kind of long form stuff that I think is going to be lost. And in some places, it's going to be filled by the ProPublicas of the world. But the concern on that is, you know, these nonprofit journalist organizations have been set up, but in many ways, they're competing with the for-profit smaller companies, and they're not like augmenting their skills in that way. So they're just adding another competitor to the market. You mentioned the competitiveness of it, and that's another factor, I think, with, with the media and that is there's a big emphasis for any any media organization that they have enough viewers or enough clicks. If they're online, they need people to click on those stories. And if they're television or any kind of video, they need people to watch. Otherwise, their business model suffers. So I, that brings me back to this subject of extremism. Is extremism a, a, something that generates clicks and viewers these days? Uh, no, and I don't think so. And I think that's probably a reflection of of the new normal. Think to the the summer of European attacks that we had a few years ago, or actually just in the U.S. context, when San Bernardino happened, um, you had a media stakeout for seven days. When Pulse nightclub happened, it was for four days. And then the numbers get smaller and smaller uh, as more attacks happen um, because we're getting used to it. And there's some concern about complacency at some point. I mean, that, that said, I mean, you don't, you don't want an overreaction too. I mean, there aren't people hiding in your bed trying to kill you at night from ISIS. So there's got to be some sort of balance in the two. We've spent a lot of time talking about terrorism and extremism that comes that could come into the United States from overseas. But I know you study domestic or organic terrorism and extremism. What can you say about the current trends in that area? It's an interesting time. So you've got a thousand active investigations for domestic terrorism which is what the FBI terms as everything besides ISIS. So it's far-right extremism, far-left, single issue. Uh, and then you have a 1,000 active investigations for ISIS-related activities, and that could be domestic or homegrown terrorists or, or um, folks from overseas. So uh, in the, basically the, the, the threat from a purely number standpoint is, is generally on par. You've seen 
less sophisticated attacks recently, you know, the the attempt for a, a car ramming, the, the occasional kitchen knife attack in a, in a mall. Uh, and then you've also seen this really interesting dynamic, which is what we term in the academic community, reciprocal radicalization. So, you know, the far right will feed off of the Islamist or the jihadist um, sphere. And so if, a, if there's an attack by a domestic terrorism terrorist, then ISIS will say, you know, that, that shows you they don't want you here. And if there's an attack by a jihadist, it says, you know, that shows you our country's under attack. And so they're, they're, they, they play off each other. Are there any common threads with the domestic ones? You mentioned some of them are sort of one-offs or they're isolated issues. Or are there any common drivers? Yeah, for the homegrown terrorists of, of the ISIS variety, they tend to be young, they tend to be male, the average age is 28 or so. They tend to be spread out in, in terms of geography. You know, they're in all 50, 50 um, states, the active investigations, but only t- 28 states have had an arrest. They all are online, obviously. They're all using encrypted apps. And then there's a general sense of, of you know, I interview a lot of these guys, and there's a general sense that these guys want to be bigger than they are. So they're either complete failures in life or are activating pretty well in life, but still want something more. And sometimes the foreign terrorist organization can provide that outlet, as ridiculous as that sounds. And then there's the other dynamic, which is the the want to build a utopian society overseas, I think was a big driver for the U.S. guys. What about the domestic terrorists that, that have no, that don't have, that have a focus on America, that have a problem with something in America? Yeah, so for the far right or white supremacist movements, you've got, you've still got the old school clan movements, which is, you know, the clan rallies and, and all of that. But um, you have seen a shift to the online space like 8chan and Gab, where you're seeing, you know, one-off folks communicating with each other uh, in the online space and never meeting up in line uh, in, in real world. And you have seen a spike, especially this year, in the number of attacks by primarily white supremacists. Can you attribute the activity to the online, just the ease of connecting uh, with each other? Would you say that's a big factor in just how these things are happening now? Absolutely. I think you look at the the New Zealand shooter, too, who by all rights couldn't find anyone in the real world to agree with him and then went online and found thousands to agree with him. Uh, And so they get a a little bit of of confidence boost, finding a community and saying, okay, well, well, maybe my views aren't crazy because everyone on 8chan agrees with me. You've studied this so much. You have to have some thoughts on on what the country, what the federal government, and maybe even what individuals can do going forward. What would you say needs to be done to stem the tide of any kind of resurgence of ISIS or stem the tide of extremism in the United States? I don't think we've done enough on the front end. So I've interviewed a lot of families of, of kids who joined the Islamic State or attempted to join the Islamic State. And they've got no options, right? So, like, it's, if you're a 15-year-old talking about how great ISIS is, do you do nothing and hope it's a phase, like they grow out of it, or do you call the FBI and potentially talk to your loved one behind a prison bar for the next 20 years? And we haven't provided a third way, which should be interventions or disengagement programs. So bringing together social workers, mental health professionals, mentors, things like that, that can get somebody off the path to radicalization uh, and back into a kind of a normalcy. And there, that seems a little, you know, you think about it, you say that's a little bit soft for a problem like terrorism, but from a purely practical standpoint, it's cheaper to try that route than it is to um, run an investigation with two guys in a van running eight-hour shifts, watching a guy for three years and then arresting him and housing him for 20. I, I think it's incumbent on us both from a practical standpoint, but also from a moral standpoint to provide a third way for families that are concerned about loved ones. On that subject, do you happen to know if there's any empirical research that says that could be effective? Well, it, we're going to see a lot more research um, soon because Europe has been forced to do this because they don't same, have the same legal regime that we do uh, on, on terrorism. There is some data that, said, that suggests that it works when it comes to white supremacy. So there's programs in Germany, Exit Germany, which works on um, getting extremists out of um, neo-Nazi movements that have been effective. Uh, in the U.S. context, it's the great debate of whether gang prevention is effective or not. At the end of the day, it comes down to the individual, but I do think it's, it's worth the effort. Seamus Hughes, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. 
learn more about Seamus Hughes and the program on extremism at George Washington University, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let people know by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion, or you can get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook group that you can join, a Facebook page you can follow, and we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.